star goes. So we've got this funny situation. Brita are at the top and they own Ticker and Saka. And uh, Ticker have always been masters of making budget rifles. Brita, uh, Saka have always made high-end rifles. Now Brita wants Saka to make cheap rifles, but keep the price high. And we're the suckers that have been caught in the middle. So what um, Saka are trying to do, and they're not happy about doing this, they're trying to copy Ticker, the Ticker design, but without actually making it identical, otherwise there'd just be no Ticker. And the, the problem with that is um, we've got a rifle that's not quite a Ticker, it's definitely not a Sarko. It's a budget cost cut rifle, and there's huge amounts of problems. I would suggest you do not buy Sarko ever again until such time as they completely change the design. Don't waste your money, don't go there. It's mm -hmm. simple as that. Are you talking about the A7? A7 through the A5, yeah. yeah. There's some really good shooters out there, but there's a risk that you just, you know, you've got to, if you do come to bet it, you have to redesign it yourself, and it's, it's a bit of a mission, so, yeah. Some, like I say, some shoot really well, but when they don't shoot, you, you've got problems, so. Yeah. All right, so let's have a look at the inside of this. So we've got the aluminium recoil lug. So in the past we always made our rifles with a recoil lug built into the action and that was to take the recoil and would allow it to return to battery. So it comes back forwards and then she's right again. But um, these days they, they stopped doing that because of the wastage when they, because the sure. Europeans like to mill out from the whole billet, um, they don't want to see all this wasted material being thrown out and plus this, this time, you know, tooling time and all this stuff around. So <coughs> instead they've omitted that recoil lug altogether and put it in here, which is a tricky proposition. It can go wrong. Mm. Um, but in this case it's worked out really well. Now the stock is not, the, the rifle is not free floated and that's usually a no-no. You, you should really have your um, barrel free floated so that nothing affects it. Again, that's to do with your harmonic vibrations. But in this stock here, there's two pressure points here, which um, produce a slightly upward force. You now, with your factory rifle, you shouldn't try and free flight these. Just don't, don't do it, because um, for one, it avoids the warranty. But two, this whole system just works. This whole budget sort of system just come together and it works really well. Um, so when you get this, this is the stainless rifle with uh, aluminium recoil. Like the stainless and aluminium shouldn't normally go together if you're into boats and things. You just you know that that's a no-no because of the electro, uh, sorry, galvanic reaction that goes into the battery terminal. It rusts uh, to a white sort of powder. So when you when you first get one of these rifles, pull it apart and grease the lug here, and then with just regular axle grease or whatever you want to use, but something like that, grease all through here. Can John use his KY? Do your trigger if you want to do your trigger. This one's this one's set at its maximum uh, at its lightest pull, so that's this one's right on 1.5 pound now. So that's good for precision work. Once once it's all greased up, <coughs> put it back together over the lug as best as you can. You so again, that's not free floated. Now with these two M6 screws, uh, you can put a little bit of Loctite at the top here, 243 Loctite is probably one of the better ones on a stick, and then grease the bottom of the, the bolt there, put the two in. Now if you don't, re realistically you should have a torque wrench for these rifles because this is so flimsy through this area here. If you don't have a torque wrench, you need to just nip it up, that's the key. With the old rifles we used to do them up quite tight. With these, if you go over 35 um, inch pounds, you really run the risk of um, ruining the rifle and it won't shoot straight. So when you nip them up, just have a feel here, you can do it by hand, but you've sort of got to, it's actually a lot easier when you, um, if this dodgy thing works. <laughs> it's a bit easier when you've got a new rifle, you can um, just undo it a half a turn and do it up a half a turn and just actually see what factory sort of how it felt coming from the factory. But then sometimes it's a balls up as well. So anyway, so I've just nipped it up just lightly. Now I'm just going to go just about a quarter of a turn past that light nipped up. I used to yeah. always say, turn it till you strip it, and then back quarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> 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 
So they, that's all you do with these buggers here, and then any more than that, and you'll start causing problems. And after that, if you, if you do over top them, then you have to bed them, and that's it. And so on this plastic one here, this fouring has to be stabilised first, and then it can be bedded, and then it can be free floated, and there's a different rifle. And it will bring the groups down to the river, even on these, even if you've got a quite an one, it will bring the groups down a bit. But like I said, if, if you don't have to mess with it, don't mess with it. But um, if you really want to sort of start getting more into the uh, serious sort of accuracy, then it's one of those jobs that you, you might want to go ahead and do. So we have a stabiliser kit, which is just that fills this whole area here and just makes it solid for the resin. And then the bedding kit, which is the metal fill, and that's just really tough, tough repair. Yeah, and then see this one's had a suppressor on it. <coughs> And there's a heavy carbon build up through here. So this is one of the, the problems with these is, is you've got a really light barrel, super light, and you put a suppressor on it, which is trapping heat, and then it's condensing against it and you're getting carbon attracted to that. So you run a serious risk of actually ruining this rifle by um, continuing to use it that way, because that's quite... Well, would you recommend to... Because I, I clean that pretty much every time we use it, and it has this been continues cleaned? to be built up. No, it hasn't, dirty, it hasn't this time. Yeah, just got to keep at it, I'm yep. afraid. Yeah, just got to keep at it. KG1, that's a, a solvent purely for carbon. Yep. It would work quite well for this. Yep. Now I can see that you had a, whoever, what, what brand of suppressor is it? Um, Hardy, is it? No, um, the guy in uh, South Greystone, is it? Is it yeah. uh, Greystone Games? Okay, see this uh, collet mark on here? That's good because it means that it's nice and tight. It's not um, wobbling around and affecting your accuracy. So that's good. Good tight collet. But you, you do make sure you get rid of that carbon. It will rust out the stainless barrel. It will just corrode it right out. Yeah. So there's a few tricks. If you if you want to suppress a ticker, be aware of the heat build up. It's there's a potential for ruining accuracy through um, through neglect of the of the bore. Uh, or through overheating it, these sort of things. So it's a very, very lightweight barrel, and they, the warranty is generally void once we put suppressors on them. But uh, in New Zealand, we um, we sort of take it for granted. We've seen suppressors for a few years now, and everyone just throws them on, and it's just like a normal everyday item. People just think it's what you do, but it's not. It's a new thing, it's a new technology, and it's not to be treated as just something you just chuck on. Um, it's treated like a specialised tool. It's, it's a potential pipe bomb. You've got to understand there's a lot of suppress, suppressor blow-ups around the country. No one seems to talk about them. Um, just be, be very wary. You've got a lot of gases going in there. And if you go too short in your barrel, see this one's not too bad, but some of the guys cut right back. If you go too short, if you get too much powder build up, then you've got a real recipe for disaster. And once those unburned powder kernels, so they finally go off in one hit, you You've got a real problem. So, so if you go to a faster, faster burning powder, would that resolve that issue? Or <coughs> to some extent, but of course you can only go so fast with a given cartridge, so yeah, before you sort of have it treated one thing off for another. Yeah. It's, just, it's just how you approach things. I mean, say you were normally using 2D13 shortcut, you might go back to 2D09. If you're using 2D08, you might go back to 2D06, but there's only so far back you can go before you start jacking up pressures and going into problems from another direction. You know? So if you don't put a suppressor on one of these, they tend to recoil. So people complain that there's recoil. A lot of people complain that they don't shoot straight and it's not the right for the person. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the, it's another modern problem because in the old days when you had rifles this light, and your, your rifle was somewhere between nine and a half pound and 10 and a half pound, that was your average weight. And the other thing people complain about now is that rifles are too big. You know, they want it 16 inches or 14 inches or something like that. And we all had 303s at 25 inches and the rifles weighed nine and a half pounds. And that was that. There was no argument. And 6.5, you cut the barrel to 24 inches if you didn't have a 24 inch rifle. And you had a big Moore's reaction and quite a bit of wood on the stock and you might put a pistol grip on it and put your scope on it and away you went. And you didn't have, we didn't have suppressors or anything like that. You just, you had what you had. And if the rifle recoiled, you didn't have to shoot it straight. You didn't have to put these things on to tame the recoil, so to speak. You just, you just got to think about some of these things that we're doing, especially with the hunts stuff. When you bring in the young ones in, 
the empress goes, shh, 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 you go, you know, it's not. It's, it's a freaking fight bomb. So you think about what you're doing with these things. You take them off at the end of the day and put them away and whatever you do. So. Quite spectacular when you blow up. Yeah, well, that's a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people talk about it. Yeah, so it's just something to be aware of. All right, next question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The wooden stocks, are they free floated or do they have that pressure board as well? No, the wooden stocks tend to be free floated. Free floated yeah. But you do want, I prefer to beat those straight away. True. So yeah. they will yeah. shake quite well. And the laminate, that's a funny one. The laminate's free floated, but I find that, oddly enough, the fit isn't that fluid fit that that plastic stock is. Oh, so okay. the laminate okay. benefits from beating straight away too. Right. Yeah. yeah. So would you, would you, I mean, I prefer a wooden stock. I mean, I just prefer the wooden stock because it's traditional, but, but the, I've, I've had a, some better stock that they shot well. But interesting enough, the, the two boys on the range over there, two brothers, they've got two 6.5s actually, I just might mention, but the exact rifle is synthetic, yeah. same scope, so whole package deal. One shot, like in pinhole, yeah. and the other one was all around the pig's bum for a while, eh? You know, just two yeah. rifles, bang, same calibre, exactly the same. And they shot differently. They shot differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just, just um, that's barrel close. manufacturer as well as the helmet, um, as well as the actual beating and so forth. The existing, yeah, the existing. Well, I think that's why hunters go for the ticket because it, it's reasonably priced and it shoots well. But they just they do, shoot yeah. well thing. That's all they see. You know, but they don't actually get the guts of it. They don't understand the guts of it, like what you're saying. You know. No, I, the biggest risk we have is they're so light. So yeah. they shoot really well, yeah. but we've gone away, we've gone to this lot and, and we've gone to uh, people whining about weight. And um, we get bigger around here and then we blame the rifle. You know, it's true. Yeah. And and but it's like me, I'm writing books now. You know, I was I would always be in the hills during the week, you know, and I would spend one day in the hills at least and then one day writing, one day in the hills, one day writing. So I went from being in the hills all the time to being in the hills half the time to having to write all the time, and then you pick up your rifle, and you've got to think, well, it feels heavy, but wait up, you know, a while ago this was normal for me. Yeah. And you've got to just be a bit careful, because there's the risk is that we go really light, and then people start complaining about the recall, so we start dropping down the power, or adding too many add-ons, um, and then you yeah, we're sort of going backwards in that regard, and the animals suffer for it. Because we can't shoot straight because we're shooting all over the show like this, unless we have all these mods on them. Or we just drop the power to the point where the cartridge is just a bit useless. You know, so. and, and that carbon build up, is that like a lot of these guys range shoot, quite a few guys range shoot? I mean, to the average hunter, they might put three or four bullets through the side bin and, and might put a box or two of bullets through shooting shooting gear during the, during the year. Will they still get that carbon build up? Is it, is it, Matter of, of You'll see with those. Of okay. of Here's a really good example. Um, if you just let's say you're doing a bit of extended range work, it doesn't have to be really long range, but extended range. You know, from your gong shoots and stuff, that, that sort of pushes the limits a bit. With a suppressor on, if you're getting a heavy carbon build up at the neck of the cartridge, because it flows all the way down to the neck and it's got no room to go, right? So when you put the neck around in, the neck is just in the chamber, it's just a little bit smaller. Fire neck shot, the neck's just a little bit smaller. So the heat, you've got heat expanding the barrel and making the tolerances um, smaller you know, on the inside, and you've got this carbon coming back. And over the course of three shots, um, shot one might be 2700 feet per second, shot two, 2750 feet per second, shot three, 2800 feet per second. That's about a metre dispersion for some cartridges at 600 uh, yards. <coughs> so, you know, it's a bloody lot of dispersion. And uh, also, it can be quite dangerous if you just, your pressures are building up. You're not even hand loading up, you know, it's just doing it, it's shooting it. So, those are things you've got to watch for with the, with the carbon build up. Um, but generally speaking, as long as that, see, that rifle is quite badly carbon belt, but it'll come right just to quick clean up. It's just when they get left to sit. And you get the salt spray coming, we're quite close to the coast here. And it just builds up. Yeah. Well, I was expecting most of these guys to go home tonight, check the rifle for the Christmas. I might be able to sleep. <laughs> 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 Alright, right. next question. So, what was the name of that carbon cleaner that you recommended? KG1. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is it what's the brand? Um, Kaji, the Kaji is the oh, brand. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, right. Um, you, you'll find that we load of supply stock there. So there's a few other stocks for Kaji. Yeah, products. I've got a different one that I use, which is quite big, but it's quite it's scary the amount of garbage comes out for sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. What you're saying about the needs, is that because of the Coming back from the yeah, suppressor. right to the shell, yeah, from right. suppressors. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely noticed that on my reloads. Yeah. 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 Dead necks. Yeah. So some carbon's good, you know, it works well on the bore and it can help with tolerances and, and, and copper fouling as well, it's good. But if you get too much, it's, it's a, it can become a problem for accuracy, but more so um, for corrosion because it attracts moisture. That's the best one. You don't clean them, take them home. Put them in the cover, the stainless, it'll be all right. No, I won't. I like that pump with the barrel of the suppressor. Yeah. Uh, it's just a bit, you couldn't see what was going on with the muzzle. Yeah, 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 it's bad news, eh? So we, we just got to be a bit more careful. We're, we're all just chucking these things on. Go to hunting and fishing in there, they're all on the wall and they've already got the suppressors on them. We've just got to treat them a bit more like they're specialised and then we'll be all right. You know, we can really make the most of them then. It's not, I'm not anti suppressors, so I get a few guys saying they're anti suppressors and anti this and no, it's just how we go about it. It's just, it's just that I end up being the only one who puts my hand up and says, wait up, what's going on here? And that's what we have to do for a lot of people. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go to traditionalist over here. <laughs> Rubbish.